It was my grandmother who introduced me to the magic of cinema. A dream within a dream. Hop in. I came to Australia for a visit. Stay on. And I stayed for the rest of my life. I don't actually remember Australian film without David Stratton. They're kind of inseparable. David is so much a part of the Australian film culture. He loves cinema. My first experience of Australian cinema was The Overlanders. Good on you, mate. Good on you, digger. I didn't know it then, but it began a love affair with this country and its cinema. You know, you get to see our traits in our movies and remind ourselves that that's who we are. The greatest little country in the world, no risk. You white bastard. You black bastard. <laughs> We are a nation of storytellers. That's pretty goddamn special. Never let the truth get in the way of a good yarn. <laughs> These stories are more than stories. They do give us insight into ourselves, into our relationships. <laughs> You're terrible, Muriel. Can I drive? <laughs> a nation found its identity through cinema, and so did I. This is going straight to the pool room. This is my journey through the movies that made our nation. Film has the power to change lives. I know because it changed mine. We are pre-wired as humans to be fundamentally interested in the experience of other humans. Telling stories about ourselves matters. It's through stories that we make the world comprehensible to ourselves. And that's why we keep doing it. It's the right of any people to see their culture reflected back to them. These are the stories of the films that changed the way the world saw us. Probably see you around. And how we saw ourselves. <laughs> War changes men's natures. The films that revolutionised the Australian film industry. The game changers. I want to be a writer. This is your family! A story of how the films and those who made them broke through the status quo. I feel ridiculous. What am I supposed to do now? Samba! Strictly Ballroom is the Australian battler's dream, but presented in a wholly original way. I've never seen anything quite like it before. It's colourful, it's flamboyant, there's not a gum tree in sight. Piss off! It was no excuse for what Scott did. The hero, Scott, is a ballroom champion determined to dance to his own beat. What the bloody hell's going on, Kendall? Made in 1992, it's a tale about rejecting tradition. I bet you never saw that before which mirrors the story of its daring first-time director, Baz Luhrmann. The winner is couple number 69. In Strictly Ballroom, he mixed high-camp theatrics with small-town Australia. This was audacious filmmaking that broke new ground. Liz! Liz! Not dancing with you till you dance like you're supposed to! His canvas is operatic. That's what he loves. He wants, loves the bigness of it. He loves throwing it up there for the audience. This kind of little bit of madness. I've got my happy face on today, Liz. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah. It was so unusual. Oh, my God. In the story, Scott has an ally taking on the establishment. An unlikely novice, Fran. That's looking good. How long have you been here? Two years. And Lerman had a real-life partner in crime, too designer Catherine Martin. Her vision inspired every aspect of Strictly Ballroom. 
those visuals, those characters was something completely new and I think that's why it resonated with a lot of people. The whole glitz and the glamour, the costumes, the art direction, they did amazing things. Strictly Ballroom's showy aesthetic began in Baz Luhrmann's childhood. He grew up in the world of dance and his mother was a ballroom dance teacher. All we're concerned about is what you do in front of the camera. While his father ran a petrol station in rural Australia. And his mix of camp and lovable characters gives Strictly Ballroom much of its heart. Son, can I bend your ear for a tick? Not now, Dad. Don't you speak to your father like that. He's trying to talk to you. Talk to him, Doug. You adore these people. You may be kind of making fun of them, but Australian humour loves its characters. Strictly is over the top. If you want to take a style, you've got to go for it. What's going on? Baz Luhrmann is somebody who actually sees the world differently. Terry's hit the nail on the head, Merv. Let's not start chucking the babies out with a bathtub. I'm 100% behind it, Barry. The way he photographs the film, there is often a slightly cartoonish dimension. Pathetic little fag. You hear that? That's the future of dance sport, and no one, but no one's going to change that. Against the odds, Scott and Fran succeed. And Baz and Catherine did too, forging a bold filmmaking style of their own. The triumph of the dance matched an unbelievable opening night reception in Cannes in May 1992. In my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined what happened last night would happen. Now, I've never seen such a thing as the opening of Strictly Ballroom in Cannes, where the, the ovation went on for like 12 minutes. It was astounding. The film's success triggered a bidding war of international sales. It was a springboard for a bigger stage. In 1996, the work of the most famous English playwright got a makeover. Do you buy your thumbnails, sir? I do buy my thumbs, sir! Do you buy your thumbnails? Sir. Romeo and Juliet's contemporary setting with a brazen new take burst onto the screen. He took Shakespeare and turned it into a gang war picture without losing what Shakespeare, uh, you know, intended for it. Then, in 2001, came the hallucinogenic Moulin Rouge. Baz Luhrmann reinvented the musical. I mean, it's an incredible piece of work. And it was crazy bold at the time. I mean, now it sort of looks like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Flying around on a trapeze at, like, midnight, running my hand over all those men with their top hats. Amazing. The three films became known as the Red Curtain Trilogy and put Baz and Catherine in the pantheon of world cinema. I remember the start of my magical journey with film was going to the movies in England as a child with my grandmother, Jessie Wells. I called her Granny, and I owe her, I guess, my career and my life in a way. My father was in the British Army in Burma. And my mother was a volunteer with the Red Cross. My grandmother effectively looked after me. We went to see films almost every day. And I just became seduced as a small boy by that magic. When the lights would dim and the curtains would open, there was something magical about it. But a career in film was always a pipe dream. All that changed when, in 1966, I was offered the director's job at the Sydney Film Festival. I was thrilled. There was just one problem. We didn't have a film industry at all. Yes, we had newsreels, television had started, but we weren't financed to make feature films. Philip Adams was one of many lobbying the government for support for an Australian film industry. 
and there was this impatience to do something. And I wrote the most influential sheet of paper I've ever written in my life. And it started off, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It is time to see our own landscapes, hear our own voices, and dream our own dreams. And I was doing my bit to nurture film culture too. At the Sydney Film Festival, we created short film competitions. The entries came from directors who had become some of Australia's most influential filmmakers. When I did my first short films, when he was running the Sydney Film Festival, people would boo and hiss at the films and get up and walk out. But I think having those public screenings opened doors for young filmmakers. At this point, we need to decide whether this preoccupation with violence is necessarily unhealthy. And the question is an enormously complex one. I remember after the screening, a distributor said, we've seen the film, it's really interesting, I'd like to distribute the film. And I was so naive, I, I said to him, what does distribute mean? By the early 1970s, it's fair to say I had changed. And so had the industry. Federal funding was at last made available for Australian films. It was like a whole lot of people crawling across the desert and suddenly to somebody with water. All these filmmakers suddenly came across the sand and said, we want some of this, we've got things to say. Hey, what a colossal bit of skirt. <laughs> Australian movies came thick and fast. They were bawdy, they were more than slightly vulgar, but they were ours. Anyway, what Chanda was shortened to Chanda. At the time that uh, Beresford, Humphreys and I were making Barry McKenzie, Tim Burstall was making a film called Stork. Both of them were represented the first wave of Ocker filmmaking. Burstall then picked it up again with Alvin Purple. Many people in Australia felt these films were absolutely abhorrent and were looking for nicer, sweeter films. And lo and behold, along comes a pity get hanging rock. What we see and what we seem are but a dream. A dream within a dream. The haunting panpipes that open one of Australia's most influential films, Picnic at Hanging Rock, are unforgettable. As is the film and its central character, Miranda. Trotting down the paddock on a... It's something about the character of Miranda that is spooky. I won't be here much longer. She's connected to, you know, other worlds. She knows things other people don't know. From the moment I read it, I was so excited by just how different it felt. Made in 1975 with funds from the South Australian Film Corporation, the first state-run studio, Picnic was an assured foray into the arthouse genre that until Peter Weir had eluded Australian filmmakers. You can't mistake his films for anybody else's work. I think Peter Weir helped the Australian film industry to grow up. Peter Weir was one of the directors I'd championed at the Sydney Film Festival. This was his second feature. He'd been gripped by Joan Lindsay's novel that was the basis for the film. There she is, ladies. Hang and rock. It was a tremendous unease that the book created, enthralled me. It was irresistible reading. And so I began to, to look for what caused that unease. And I think that is directly linked to something which doesn't have all the answers supplied. Peter Weir was pushing things much further than a lot of other directors in realms that were going beyond the naturalistic. There's a magic inside that particular story. <laughs> the film's pivotal action happens just outside Melbourne, here at Hanging Rock. I've seen Picnic at Hanging Rock dozens of times, but this is the first time I've been here, and it is extraordinary. I feel like I know the place, and yet, of course, I don't know the place. Peter Wynn made a beautiful piece of art. 
a lyrical look at the Australian landscape and juxtaposed with these uptight, stitched up young Victorian schoolgirls. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds to shake the darling parts of May. The girls are symbolically dressed in white, an idea that came from Weir's wife, Wendy. It's a costuming masterstroke that gives the scene a virginal innocence and conveys an eerie sense of the past. You wouldn't have the time, I suppose, miss. I thought it was deeply beautiful, spiritual. It wasn't just telling a story. He was using the camera in a way that was very artistic and, and like a painter. I wanted the film to look like one of those Impressionist paintings that was produced by Tom Robertson, etc. Those paintings were very romantic. And what struck me is the way they used to use the harsh Australian light and make it quite beautiful. And don't worry about us, mademoiselle. We shall only be gone a little while. In capturing beauty in the bush on a hazy summer's day, Peter Weir's film also cast a spell on people who would later become pivotal to the Australian film industry. It had quite an influence on me. I think I saw John Jarrett in it and went, I want to be in, I want to be in a film. It did have a lot of beautiful girls in it. Maybe that's got something to do with it too. So I saw Picnic at Hanging Rock and went, oh, I want to be in a film like that. Um, I want to play Miranda. And it gave me such hope. I thought, you can make a film like that in Australia? Or well, maybe I can. Maybe the reason that the film embedded itself so deeply in the Australian consciousness is because of the mysterious atmosphere that Peter Weir managed to create. When the girls actually walk up through that little gap in the rock the last time you see them, there was some part of me quite psyched up and just doing that moment like something was going to happen as we went through that gap. Miranda! That moment, Peter does this incredible cut. Miranda! Miranda, don't go up there, come back! <coughs> that stayed with me forever. That was absolutely chilling and a real, that was incredible mastery of filmmaking. Something terrible has happened. Picnic at Hanging Rock succeeds because its plot, a plot many people believed was true, remains forever unsolved. The mystery of it, it was beguiling. What happened to those girls? You know what I'm telling you! How can it just leave us like that in a state of not knowing? And yet what an interesting place for a film to leave us. And I think that's one of the, the secrets of why it's been such an important film in the Australian psyche. Seeing the sophistication of Peter Weir's work in this beautiful film, I knew it was the moment his career would take off. Go! He made a seminal movie of mateship and war in Gallipoli, and went on to direct Hollywood pictures like Witness, Dead Poets Society and The Truman Show. We're both men. <laughs> Weir was a key part of what was coined the new wave of Australian cinema in the 70s and early 80s. Oh, shit. Australian cinema was blossoming. So I grew up with a love of Australian cinema. They were iconic Australian films, which, you know, we we're really proud of. The films reflected the dominant white Australian Anglo-Saxon culture. But this creative explosion in filmmaking helped nurture craft and confidence in the industry. <laughs> I remember distinctly feeling that, like, this is the first time I've sat in a movie theater and the accents are your accent. Kiss me, Bob. Piss off. There was something of me on that screen, and that's what I was connecting to. Um, it just felt good to watch those films. Get the breaker. A whole generation of craftspeople, from art departments to cinematographers and sound, cut their teeth on these new wave films. Breaker Morand from 1980 was no exception to the resourcefulness of these crews. Oscar, you're 
Directed by Bruce Beresford, it's the story of the court-martial of three Australian soldiers fighting for the British during the Boer War. The movie was shot in South Australia. Bruce sent me a postcard from Borough and said, I'm here making a film about the Boer War on a budget of $800,000. I remember a journalist in New York asking Bruce, what would you have liked? He said, I would have liked to have fought the Boer War with more than 18 extras. Well, we also had them playing both sides. The same men were both. The Boers rode in, and then I dressed the Boers in the British uniforms, and they fought. So we did one lot and then the other. Well, you never saw them together. Harry Harbord Morant, you have been found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. When I was researching the film in the Imperial War Museum in London, I found a letter from a, um, a member of the firing squad to his mother. Would you make sure they are posted for me, please? And he said to his mother, we executed these two Australians today. That moment when the two characters walk away from camera at the end of Breaker Morant, very moving. And he said, as they walked towards the chairs, they held a hand. And they reach out and hold each other's hands just says so much about the importance of, of male friendship and in, in the Australian culture, it, I think it's extremely eloquent. You wouldn't think of it, but when I read that it had really happened, that they held hands, I thought, of course they would, of course they would. Oh, shoot straight, you bastards. Don't make a mess of it. Oh. Breaker Morant won 10 Australian Film Institute awards and received an Oscar nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay and sent Bruce Beresford to Hollywood. When we sold Breaker Morant in America, someone said to me, well, we better revoice it with American accents. And I said, over my dead body, they're going to get used to our accents just in the way we've got used to theirs. I was at Variety for 21 years after leaving the Sydney Film Festival. And with the fabulous Margaret Pomeranz on The Movie Show and then at The Movies, I travelled the world interviewing famous film icons while continuing to write Variety reviews. I wrote over a thousand reviews during my time there. David's initial reputation came out of what he did at the Sydney Film Festival. It was only through Variety that David became kind of an internationally known critic. I wouldn't discount also his look, because David was instantly identifiable. The white hair, the white beard, and the kind of the same suit most of the time. No other Australian critic became known outside of Australia. I still review movies today. But I remember a time when I didn't know such careers existed. Uh, one of my friends at school, at Salisbury, had an older sister, and she had Picture Goer. So I discovered Picture Goer through Bridget. See, I remember her name. And um, I had a bit of a thing for Bridget. She was like two years older. Yes, yeah, so that's how I discovered it. And I persuaded my parents to um, subscribe, to add it to their newspaper subscription. Like the rest of the world, I loved these movie stars of the 40s and 50s. But there was one face you never saw in movies at that time, not until Charles Chevelle's landmark film, Jeddah. It's the story of an Aboriginal girl, Jeddah, adopted by a white family, raising her on their cattle station as a European. But I still think it's our duty to try and do something with them. Bring them closer to our way of living. Charles Chevelle, the Australian director who first cast Errol Flynn in a movie, was a maverick filmmaker. Together with his wife, Elsa, they made Jeddah in the period when there was no funding for Australian films. Dreaming again? You know, Barty, sometimes I dream I'm out there with them. Maybe I will go one day, just for fun. Oh, Jeddah, whatever would you do out in the bush with all those naked monkeys? 
I remember the startling experience of seeing Jeddah in a cinema in England. The subject was amazing and critiqued prevailing attitudes of the day. The Chevelles had to raise the film's entire budget themselves. They were offered $100,000 from an American studio to cast a Hollywood screen siren who would have been blacked up for the leading role. But Charles refused to compromise. He cast Rosalie Kunoth Monks as Jeddah and Robert Tudor Wally as Marbuck. Both were from the Northern Territory. Why was it controversial? Well, I think it was controversial it was because my grandfather had the idea of casting two unknown Aboriginal people in the lead roles, and that was just not thought of in the mid-50s. It must be fun to dance a robbery. Real wild fellow one. Charles went to Menzies at the time to see what sort of assistance he could get, and Menzies was very, very scathing of the whole idea. And a lot of media people at the time and industry people said, you, you know, you'll never, you'll never make a film again. It'll be death at the box office. And I think in some way, I think that uh, even propelled my grandfather even more to make this film. You have to remember that when Jeddah was made, the indigenous people of this country were not even listed among the population. They were part of the flora and fauna. No one else was presenting an Aboriginal man and a young Aboriginal woman as worthy of admiration and being seen as beautiful. I remember seeing Jeddah when I was really young and then seeing it again when I was sort of older and in the industry. I mean, Rosalie Kunoth Monks is brilliant in it and so is Robert Tudawali, but it's a very odd film. When you look at it, the Indigenous characters, they've been dubbed over and they're just, someone's going... You know, and that's, the, that's meant to be them speaking. So I just look at that and I sort of, I'm so appalled by that laziness that the filmmakers had. So there's some challenges with that film, but it was of its time. Despite its flaws, Jeddah is a remarkable film, not only because it was the first Australian feature with Indigenous leads, but also because it was the first Australian feature in colour. And the first ever Australian film to be invited to Cannes, where it competed for the coveted Palm Door. Films of that era were meant to have a happy ending, to have a tragic ending like that. There's something in people's minds for years to come. So let the howling wind start blowing, let the raindrops keep on flowing. Half a century after Jeddah, an indigenous led Australian film did win awards at Cannes and around the world. That film is Samson and Delilah. A deeply moving love story between two teenagers in a remote Aboriginal community from an unflinching Indigenous director, Warwick Thornton. Samson and Delilah was, I thought, a very confronting film. Mm -hmm. Did you set out to make a confronting film? No, but yes. <laughs> I had these two characters. I'm going to write a petrol sniffer's love story. It is an incredibly dark film. I'd be bullshitting not only to those two characters, I'd be bullshitting to Australia if I was to make that film any lighter. Warwick Thornton grew up in Alice Springs. After a troubled adolescence, he made a number of successful short films and built a career as a cinematographer. Samson and Delilah was his first film as a director, a film based in the truth of his own experience and made in his own cinematic language. So we won't rehearse this. Do you see that Samson's moved his bed near yours? I'm a writer, I'm a wordsmith, and here comes this beautiful, largely silent story in which, you know, the narrative is absolutely clear when you're learning your craft, you hear cinema is a form of storytelling which the story is told in images. 
And you go, well, yeah, yeah, I get that. But what does that actually mean? You see a film like Samson and Delilah and go, ah, oh, that's what it means. Samson and Delilah, in some ways, it's Book of art. The film depicts indigenous dispossession and the struggle to deal with the ongoing impact of colonization. When Samson and Delilah leave their remote community, they become further marginalized within the broader society. There I actually learned something for the first time that I'm looking at a culture that is struggling in, the, in their own land and the horror is quite overwhelming. When pain is truly there for a reason because of the truth of the story and the truth of, of history in our existence, and Australia stands up and watches it, that's mm. so powerful and yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. It's one of my all-time favourite Australian films. Almost kind of Shakespearean on some level, you know. The take on huge subjects like truth and justice and give it to me in a way that feels very human. Well, the characters started dictating to me when I was writing what happens. Well, one of them should really die because they've been through so much abuse. And I had these two characters, Samson and Delilah, going, we've fought this hard, we've fought this strong, and we've been through so much shit. How dare you try and kill us off? We're going to live. The million to one outside in a sense, the kids in the movie are a parallel for Indigenous filmmaking in this country, rising up to be counted. Warwick Thornton's Samson and Delilah was a catalyst for Indigenous filmmaking and absolutely opened the floodgates for people to go, wow, look at this, another way of storytelling. Those characters resonated so powerfully. But, you know, it's not depressingly bleak. It gives you something to hang on to, which is tremendously important. To give time to a story like that and to tell it that way Bit of a, a game changer for cinema. Should have won an Oscar. Although it was acclaimed around the world, Samson and Delilah was made for Australians to see an invisible Australia. The film premiered in Alice Springs at an outdoor screening by the Todd River. It was one of the most mixed black and white crowds outside football ever seen. The authenticity of the story is important because for me, even if films are confronting, they have a right to be seen. I think that uh, censorship people tend to overprotect us most horribly. And I think they have a very uh, poor idea of what we in this country can take. During the 1960s, I was actively campaigning to overthrow the draconian censorship rules in Australia. I was appalled because many of these films I'd already seen uncensored in England. Films deemed too sexual, blasphemous or violent were either banned or heavily cut. It was films of real stature and real importance that were being attacked by the Philistines at the Film Censorship Board at the time. They were ignorant, stupid people. You're seeing an abridged, mutilated version. Now that's criminal. Just making my hackles rise now just to think of it. It used to be shocking in Australia. You couldn't show anything because we weren't grown up to see the odd piece of genitalia or breast, you know, which was stupid. After the furor around the banning of Stieg Bjorkman's Swedish film I Love, You Love, the tide turned in favour of changing the rules. 
The government introduced an R classification in 1971 to allow for films of an adult nature. But you have to be careful what you wish for. Turkey Shoot is one of the most sadistic and pointlessly violent films that's ever been made in this country. It really is an obnoxious piece of work. Set in a prison camp for social deviants, Turkey Shoot is a story about hunting human prey as sport. The film is supposedly a commentary on totalitarianism. My big disappointment, I suppose, is that David Stratton didn't like it. He didn't get my particular sense of humor, um, my sense of irony, and, and the fact that cinema now, again, now and again has to be outrageous. And I like occasionally to make outrageous cinema. Almost, no, okay. no, I don't know what else to say about Turkey Shoot. <laughs> Turkey Shoot is part of a genre of films later referred to as Ozploitation pictures. Today, some of the Ozploitation films have achieved cult status, and some of them are pretty good. Patrick, for example, is one of the better ones. We wanted to be in the mix with genre pictures, films like Patrick. They were kind of thrillers and horror stuff that we hadn't really dipped our toe in the water with at all. So, you know, God bless them. Many of these films featured breakneck action and helped develop a skilled film industry. Man from Hong Kong, we shot this amazing stunt fight scene on top of Ezra. It was a great big stunt spectacular. And that was shot in a hurry too. But the one exploitation film that stands head and shoulders above the rest, of course, is the first Mad Max. Made in 1979, Mad Max is a turbocharged Western on wheels. Inspired by the oil crisis of the 1970s, its world is on the brink of collapse, with law enforcement overwhelmed by murderous highway gangs. I believed it. I believed that that was the future. That's what my future was going to look like, and it was in my country. Directed by George Miller, a young doctor working in casualty who had experienced firsthand the carnage on Australia's roads, Mad Max would make its director and Mel Gibson superstars in the world of cinema. Well, George, I don't know whether you've ever seen this, but back in 1979, there was a preview of a film called Mad Max, and that was the first review I did for Variety for which I got paid. Something of a new departure for Australian films. All stops out, fast-moving exploitation pick. Have a look. Wow. And it's a good review. I was quite excited about it, I remember. Nor does he dwell on the violence. Plenty of horror is implied. But very little scene. The death of Max's wife and baby is shot in a particularly distant way. I'm glad you picked that up because it was one of the big, big things. I know it was. It's to stay imply it. Yeah. It suffuses the film with a certain degree of a feeling of violence. And people remember things that weren't actually on the screen. It looks like being a winner down under. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Yeah, yeah. You think I look silly, don't you? <laughs> Made for only $350,000, for the next 20 years, Mad Max held the Guinness World Record for the biggest profit from a film. But more than that, Mad Max revolutionized action filmmaking and created the most successful returnable movie brand to emerge from Australia. The most influential post-apocalyptic movies were born. Bring them back to me, alive, you will reveal. For Billing to Max. You've done this before? Many times.
Here he goes. Okay, Mad Max 4, Charlie's to run. Not enough directors and writers are making that connection. Like if I put a female in a normally male role, hey presto, it's fresh. It's, it's, it hasn't been seen before. Still not happening enough. Fury Road is the most commercially successful Australian film ever made. But the same year as the first Mad Max, I remember another trailblazing film that placed women at the forefront of filmmaking itself. Here is the story of my career. My brilliant career. It's the most famous Australian film made by women about a woman. Headstrong Sibylla thinks there's got to be more to life than drudgery and drought. She wants to be an independent woman and choose her own career, just like the film's producer, Margaret Fink. Once upon a time, to even want to be a filmmaker, such as myself, if I say vainly, in 1952, uh, was unthinkable. Don't you ever dream there's more to life than this? I remember voicing it at a party and saying, well, I'm going to make films, and a girl saying, <laughs> saying indignantly, you can't say that. And I said, well, I just said it. My Brilliant Career is based on a novel by a young feminist, Miles Franklin, written in 1901. Well, I was born feminist, and of course it is a feminist book. And I thought, I'm going to make a film from My Brilliant Career. It took Margaret 13 years to raise the money, in which time she found a director working as a set dresser and convinced her to do the movie. I was very scared of it and I didn't think I was really ready. And it really was the moment when someone said to me, oh, who are you going to cast? She's obviously got to be really plain. And I said, well, but why? And they said, well, because all the time through the book, she's talking about how ugly she is. <laughs> Nobody loves me. Of course. And I went, duh. She's a girl. All women pull themselves apart, especially an adolescent. And, and that's when I thought, if a man does this film, he'll completely stuff it up. He will never get it. No matter what, I have to do it. The girl they cast was anything but plain. Judy Davis was perfect as the defiant role model for a generation of women determined to stand up for themselves. You're uh, new here, aren't you? Do you work in the kitchen? I'd be obliged to you, sir, if you'd take yourself out of the way. Unless you want me foot in your big fat face. I remember seeing my brilliant career and recognising that it was a film that was about what was going on in our own lives of, of women establishing themselves as worthy equals. How about a reward? Having a mind, having an imagination, being something other than a chattel, for God's sake. Let me go. Off camera, the director was fighting her own battles. There was all this carry on, you know. Will it cut together? Will she faint and fall over in the desert? Oh, she seems much smaller than we expected. Oh, Sibylla. The heroine, who doesn't need a man to save her, was a last-minute casting decision. Well, I was summoned to an audition. Margaret picked me up to go to the casting. I said, so, is this a children's film? Because she'd sent me the script. And she shrieked, no, no. <laughs> and then I said, and, you know, what do you have to, what do you have to do with the film? And she said, I'm the producer of this goddamn movie. So it really didn't start well. I was approached by one of them today. Goodness, dear. He was very forward. He wanted to kiss me. Judy came in and she read the scene that I'd heard over and over and over with maybe 120 young actresses. Can I drive? And I just had, like, goosebumps. I had never, ever heard it that good. I mean, really. I was in the presence of one of the world's great actors. Oh boy, oh. Judy Davis would become an international screen star, as would her leading man, Sam Neill. I was working opposite this extraordinary girl. This is like nothing I've ever seen. She was 
vivid and alive and present. What's the question? Bloody woman, I thought, I thought we should get married. Well, what a handsome proposal. How could anyone say no? She made it pretty clear from almost day, day one that I was a lightweight and, uh, and uh, never let me forget it. The film launched some brilliant careers, not just Judy Davis as Sibylla and Sam Neill as Harry Beecham, but also the director, Gillian Armstrong. I had this huge burden. Number one, it was my first feature. Number two, I did realise that all women were being judged, really, on whether that film worked. The film launched at Cannes to acclaim and went on to win six Australian Film Institute awards. When Gillian suddenly came to prominence, and people were talking about, isn't this great, there's a woman director. That's all I needed for me to go, yes, OK, there's one, then there's going to be more, and I'm going to be one of them. This much lauded trio were not the first Australian women to blaze a trail through the industry. In the 1920s, sisters Paulette, Isabel and Phyllis McDonough were business partners in the first all-female film company in Australia if not the world. Their first movie, Those Who Love, made more money than Chaplin's film The Gold Rush in Australia that year. And they were among the earliest Australian filmmakers to experiment with sound. The tragedy today is that none of their films survive intact. I want to be a writer. Trousers off too? Yes. No. Do you have a problem with nudity? Although they didn't live long enough to see the success of the female-led Australian films that followed, no doubt it would only confirm what the McDonough's already knew, that women tell brilliant stories. Sometimes, success against the odds is life-changing. Shine, made in 1996, is one of those movies. All of this. Wait. It's the real-life comeback story of a mentally troubled musical prodigy. You're David Helfcott. That's right, Beryl, that's right, that's right, that's right. I used to watch you win all those competitions. It's based on the life of David Helfcott, whom director Scott Hicks first saw perform in Adelaide in 1985. And most remarkable of all was when he'd finished playing and he left the stage and the audience started to leave the theatre, suddenly he came back on again and he started sort of playing the piano and people were streaming out of the hall. But people gathered around the piano in a totally informal way and within minutes he knew everybody's name, he was carrying on an en endless chattering this was dialogue that got into the film, and that was magic. Scott Hicks learned his craft on the film sets of Peter Weir and Bruce Beresford. That was really my film school, was seeing how some really good directors worked. Only getting his film made was a giant challenge that Scott persisted with for 10 years. My wife and I would turn up to parties with friends and you could almost see them going, oh my God, here they come with that crazy pianist story of theirs, you know, not again. No one wanted to risk funding a story about a troubled pianist made by an unknown director. Hey, baby, what about a chew? A uh, chew, baby, sure, no worries, no worries. With an actor who'd never been in a leading role in a film before. <laughs> oh, suck it to us, Liberace. And when you talk to financiers, they'd say, well, we love the script, who can possibly play this? And you go, well, I've got this brilliant actor, you see, and his name's Geoffrey Rush, and, you know, he's just, he's the doyen of the Australian stage, and he's, and they go, oh, he's never done any film? What, uh, how old is he? And you, I said, well, I think early 40s. They said, early 40s, he's never done a film? What sort of a failure is this guy? <laughs> Scott and I visited David Helfcott. We played around with could David's hands in the form of puppetry in the right shots be my hands, etc. It was David's hands and Jeffrey's face acting away. 
So we get a little closer to production and Jeffrey says to me, you know, I don't know that I can be David if he's in the room with me. I said, well, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? I knew enough about filmmaking by then to say, as long as the keyboard, my elbow and my head are all in shot at the same time, I can give you bars one to 40 on the Hungarian, list Hungarian Rhapsody number no. two. But on these bars, it's just out of my league. And that's when you've got to cut away to the people at the bar going, he's very good, isn't he? <laughs> you know. Shine helped David Helfcott deal with painful memories of his father. David, when I met him, a huge amount of his conversation was about his father, who just seemed to be ever present in his mind. The shadow of his father was there. You, you can't stop me. I'm, I'm your father, <coughs> who has done everything for you, everything. When I first showed the film to David, which is a scary experience. Hello, David. And he sat there on the floor, actually, clinging to my leg. I, I was sitting on a couch. No one will love you like me. No one like me. At the end of the screening, he said, I wish my daddy had been as nice as that. I mean, that really, that was something. It's almost as if the film helped to sort of exorcise a, a demon in a way. The thing is, I feel nothing. Shine was a smash hit around the world. For his first major film role, Jeffrey Rush won a BAFTA and Golden Globe for Best Actor. And finally, to all those people who were happy to bankroll the film as long as I wasn't in it, But the big prize was the Academy Awards, where the film had seven major nominations, including Best Picture and Best Director. If there was only going to be one win, it had to be Jeffrey. Jeffrey Rush was the first living Australian to win an Oscar for acting. Film offers flooded in. A star was born. It represented everything about the struggle to make the film, about a bunch of unknown people who got together and got international attention, about a pianist that the world had not heard about. It was life-changing. When I started championing Australian cinema at the Sydney Film Festival, I couldn't have imagined the richness of the movies that would follow. It doesn't seem like 50 years ago, but it was, 1966. My role today as an international critic is thanks to Australian cinema. He always talked good way about us, yeah? We love you, David. <laughs> today, I feel part of Australia, but I remember a time when I was the outsider looking in. Two more cake, sugar, sugar. <laughs> Next time, the films from people on the fringe. Put out your hand the stories of outsiders. How the experience of the marginalised... There you go, aren't you? How many can you, sir? ...become mainstream. Listen to 70s music. This is the 90s. 